series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by AARP Virginia. I am Trudy Murata, an AARP volunteer and community ambassador with AARP Virginia. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that empowers people to choose how they live as they age. We are here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational, and fun resources like webinars, teletown halls, discounts, and more. When it's safe to host in-person events, you'll be invited. And in the meantime, AARP will continue to offer programs like this virtually. Studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new interests. AARP encourages you to stay curious and to give yourself good mental workouts by doing something that challenges your thinking, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. While this program may not be sufficiently rigorous to define as cognitive stimulus activity, it's important to note that it's never too late to seek out new activities that challenge you and the way you think. So we applaud you and thank you for joining us today. Before we get started on today's program, I do have just a few housekeeping items to review with you. We hope to have time for questions and answers at the end of Bonnie's presentations. So please submit your comments and questions in the chat box. And if you are trying to multitask or moving around, we ask that you turn your camera off and stay muted during the presentation. And now on to today's program. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome our speaker, Bonnie Becker. Enthralled at an early age by history and geography books, Bonnie Becker has been fortunate in her adult life to travel to many places that stirred her childhood imagination. She enjoys studying up on destinations before a trip and following news from some places upon return. Beginning as a high school social studies teacher, she was with Fairfax County Public School Office of Equity and Compliance for many years, serving as the Title IX coordinator. She also taught human relations for teachers for the University of Virginia during that time. Now retired, she is teaching English for speakers of other languages to adults through the Washington English Center. Today, we are in for a real treat as Bonnie takes us on a virtual tour of the Galapagos Islands and introduces us to Lonesome George, the poster child tortoise for end endangered species and many of his friends. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Bonnie and Bonnie, the screen is now yours. Oh, Judy, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think just getting on Zoom counts as our, our brain activity for the day. I'm you know, gonna check that off my list. Well, hello everybody. Um, yes, we're going to look at the Galapagos, where the wild things are. The, Galap the Galapagos are a cluster of approximately 19 islands in the Pacific Ocean, about 600 miles west of Ecuador in South America. Only four of the islands are inhabited um, by humans, that is. The rest are designated as a UNESCO a Natural Heritage for Humanity in 1978. Thus, 97% of the Galapagos is reserved for wildlife. And the surrounding waters are de designated as a UNESCO Marine Reserve. The entire archipelago is a province of the Republic of Ecuador, and it has special status under the Constitution. Human activity and development are strictly limited and supervised. About 25,000 people live on the four inhabited islands, Santa Cruz, 
here. Um, San Cristobal down here, Isabella is here, and Floriana down there. The equator from which Ecuador takes its name cuts through the top of Isabella Island. And a fun fact about the Galapagos location is that it's on the same longitude as Peoria, Illinois, a lineup that surprises most Americans who usually do not think of South America as far as being as far east as it is. Although we associate the Galapagos with evolution as applied to animals, the islands themselves have been evolving over millions of years. The Galapagos appear near the juncture of three tectonic plates, the small Cocos plate, it's up here, the huge Pacific plate over here, and the Nazca plate on which the Galapagos are actually located. And all three of these plates are inexorably moving in different directions. Under the Nazca plate is a hot spot. This is a vent in the Earth's crust through which molten magma sporadically rises from deep within the mantle. When magma rises to the surface, it is called lava and forms a volcano. Each island has been formed by a volcano. In the case of Isabella, there are five of them all together. At least five million years ago, magma from the hotspot broke through the crust of the Nazca plate to produce the oldest island in the chain. Um, and it is known as Espanola. Over the eons, the Nazca plate has moved relentlessly eastward and Espanola was no longer over the hotspot and it stopped growing and ocean erosion began to wear it down. Eventually, another part of the Nazca plate was over the hot spot, and another volcano appeared, forming the island of Floriana, number two down here on our chart. The process repeated as various places on the Nazca plate moved over the hot spot, and with each, with each island, Erosion took its toll when the plate continued moving to the east and left the volcano with no additional lava. One million years ago, a large volcano was formed um, and this became the island of Isabella, but now only the cauldron, the caldera, pardon me, the caldera remains. And this is number three on our, on our chart. Today, with the plate still moving eastward, we have the island of Fernandina hosting the hot spot. That's number four on our chart. And Fernandina is still growing. The most recent eruption of Fernandina's volcano happened only three years ago on January 12th, 2018. This tongue of lava looks as if it is still flowing into that sea cave. In addition to the three tectonic plates, the Galapagos Islands are influenced by several ocean currents. One of these is the famous Humboldt Current. It diverges from the waters surrounding icy Antarctica and swoops up the coast of South America. Significantly, 
its cold waters keep their cool even as the current crosses the equator. This nutrient rich cold water interacts with warmer waters of the Panama current flowing south toward the equator. These factors make the Galapagos different from all other island groups in the world. It has a unique environment that is both temperate and tropical. But originally, this Eden was just solidified lava, completely devoid of plant and animal life. There are two natural ways for animals and plants to make their way to remote islands. One is by air in the form of flying or being blown by the wind, and the other is by sea, swimming or floating, or sometimes riding rafts of tangled vegetation. And here we can see a little seabird, a little seabird perched on a, just a little piece, little ledge of lava that is um, sticking out of a cliff along the, along the ocean. Animals that are good swimmers, such as sea lions and penguins and sea turtles, could have swum their way to the islands, helped along by fortuitous ocean currents. Animal experts speculate that reptiles like the tortoise may have been carried on rafts of vegetation because they are physically able to survive the sun and salt of weeks at sea. Salt resistant seeds could have ridden the waves and some seeds may have hitched a ride on the feet and the feathers of seabirds. The seabirds of course came by air, but land species of birds from the mainland would not have been able to fly that far. Plants with plumed seeds could easily have been brought on the wind, including members of the familiar dandelion family. There are no native plants with big showy flowers because such plants usually require an insect or a bird as its pollinator. And the possibility of such fly flowers and their necessary pollinators arriving at the same time was very slim. There is a large number of endemic species on the Galapagos Islands. Of course, all plants and animals came in from somewhere, but the now endemic species arrived well before human contact. Because these pioneer species were isolated by geography, they evolved by adapt adapting to the surrounding ecosystem, and they are now found nowhere else. And that is the definition of an endemic species. It evolved with its ecosystem and is found nowhere else. In contrast, a species is said to be native to an area when it occurs there naturally. But if it is found in other locations too, it is only native, not endemic. For example, oak trees may grow naturally in Illinois, but that is not the only place where oak trees grow. So they are native to Illinois, but not endemic. Endemic means nowhere else. Some of the famous endemic species are the Galapagos giant tortoise, the marine iguana, the um, Galapagos penguin, and the Galapagos sea lion. There are about 57, there are about 57 species of animals on the Galapagos Islands and 27 of them are found only in the Galapagos 
and some only on one island. Humans now come by air and sea also. A an airport originally built during World War II to help defend the Panama Canal now serves local, both locals and tourists. There are some five-star hotels, but many people choose to stay aboard small ships. And thus they can easily move among the islands to see a variety of flora and fauna. Small inflatables called pangas take tourists for up close viewing of the animals. There are no prehistoric archeological sites on the island. <clears throat> Some scholars speculate that Indians from South America may have at some time been present on the islands. An expedition by Thor Heyerdahl found some pre-Inca pottery shards, but no, um, no evidence of permanent settlements. The first recorded human contact was in 1535, when a Dominican priest was blown off course as he was sailing down the coast to Peru. He described the giant tortoises and the cacti and the inhospitable terrain and the difficulty of finding water, but there was no indigenous population. Pirates and buccaneers made use of the islands as hideouts. There were failed attempts at farming and fishing by some Europeans. A sugar plantation was tried on Santa Cruz, but the most long lasting use of the islands was as a brutal prison from which there was no escape. So why are these desolate, dry islands, hundreds of miles out in the ocean, mostly uninhabited until the early 1800s, now world famous and the dream destination of some 150,000 tourists every year. Well, of course, it's because of the man, Charles Darwin, and the tortoise, <clears throat> Lonesome George. Or as he's known in Spanish, Solitario. Jorge. We all know about Charles Darwin from his association with the theory of evolution. Darwin began with a lucky first job out of college as the naturalist on a multi-year round the world voyage on a British naval ship called the Beagle. Its mission was to survey coastal South America. Before the invention of photography, a voyage with a scientific mission would have aboard a natural scientist, that was the term uh, used at the time, who would be expected to draw what he observed. When the Beagle cruised the Galapagos Islands, Darwin made extensive notes of the similarity and differences among animals that were clearly related, but had adapted to different environments. This chart shows Darwin's famous 15 species of finches from several Galapagos Islands. Their shared and differing attributes first gave Darwin the idea of natural selection. This was eventually described in his 1859 book on origin of species by means of natural selection. Scientific thinking in Darwin's day had begun to consider the idea of evolution. He was not the first to think of the idea, but what was missing at that time 
was a mechanism by which evolution could occur. Darwin's insight, his original contribution to science was that small differences occur naturally from one generation to another. When these changes are beneficial, they are passed on to offspring. The process over time leads to development of distinct species. The Galapagos giant tortoises show this speciation. The shell of a saddleback tortoise on the right developed so that the animal could stretch its neck and reach its food source, which was up high. The favorite food for the tortoise on the left was down on the ground. So its shell had a much different shape from the saddleback. The other celebrity associated with the Galapagos is Lonesome George, the poster child, um, I mean, poster tortoise for protecting all animals from extinction. To the many whaling ships in the 17 and 1800s, the, Gal the Galapagos Islands had few resources of any value and hardly any fresh water. But the ship crews discovered that they could keep captured tortoises on board as a source of fresh meat. The tortoises could survive for many months with barely any food or water. Huge numbers of tortoises were taken from the islands for such purposes. But not only did the visiting ships take the tortoises, they also left rats. Later, other humans brought goats and dogs to the islands and the rats de devoured the tortoise eggs, the dogs became feral and the goats overgrazed what vegetation existed. Tortoise populations plummeted. When George was found on one of the more remote islands, it was determined that he was the only tortoise of his species remaining in the Galapagos. A worldwide search was undertaken to see if there were any females of his kind anywhere else, but alas, no. He did mate several times with two female tortoises from a similar species, but the resulting eggs did not hatch. Thus, George died without issue, as the genealogist would say. That species of tortoise was now extinct. A custody battle erupted over his taxidermied remains. The government of Ecuador wanted to display him in the capital city, Quito, but the islanders maintained that George belonged in the Galapagos. Well, the islanders won. Today, George resides in his own special, oops, I think we're one step ahead of ourselves here. There we are. <clears throat> George resides in his own special humidity and light controlled facility. It reminds one of a chapel holding the remains of a local saint. The number of visitors is limited as in the time inside. Photography, is allowed, but I recall that people spoke in hushed voices. And George's species of giant tortoise is not the only one close to extinction. The island of Espanola had only two males and 12 females remaining of another kind of tortoise. Fortunately, a tortoise of that species had been given to the San Diego Zoo years before and was identified for repatriation. 
Diego, as he was named, turned out to be just the right guy for the job. There are now some 2,000 of his kind of tortoise, and estimates are that Diego is responsible for at least 40% of the increase. The breeding program has ended, and just in June of last year, 2020, Diego was released into the wild. His exact age is not known, but giant tortoises can live a hundred years or more. Who knows what he will do on his own. And perhaps there may be still another back from the brink tortoise story. Remember Fernandina, the island where the volcano is currently active? In February, 2019, a female tortoise from a species not sighted for more than a hundred years was discovered on Fernandina. This tortoise had never been seen on any other island. Efforts were underway to find and assess the population, if indeed one still exists. Turtle, tortoise, what's the difference? Well, although turtles are the smaller animals, their scientific category is the bigger of the two. All tortoises are turtles but not the other way around. Tortoises are land animals, while turtles basically live in water. Turtles have more streamlined shells and have flippers in the front and on their rear legs. Shells of both animals contain nerves, so they do feel pain if the shells are cracked or broken. The name Galapagos comes from a Spanish word, Galapago, for tortoise. Well, like the African countries touting their big five, the Galapagos Islands proudly point to their big 15. So we have the Galapagos albatross, the blue-footed booby, the beautiful white Nazca booby, the red-footed boobies, the flightless comorant, and you can see that the wings of the comorant have changed over the course of time, and now these wings would never support flight, so that's why it's the flightless camarade. Here is the American flamingo and frigate birds. We also have the Galapagos hawk, the land iguana, the marine iguana, the Santa Fe iguana, Galapagos penguin, the Galapagos um, sea lion, Galapagos fur seal, and of course, the tortoise. Interestingly, Darwin's famous finches are not among, among the big 15. The star performers are the sea lions. The difference between sea lions and seals is that the seals are smaller and they have a luxurious fur coat. And because of that, they were hunted almost to extinction at, at one point. The sea lions are bigger and they have larger ear flaps and they bark. And of course, they are so cute. They are so cute. The animals show little concern for humans in their midst. 
Of course, the national park rules strictly instruct humans to stay six feet away from the animals. They were social distancing long before its current meaning. These marine iguanas look outfitted for the latest Hollywood horror movie. But marine iguanas are herbivores, vegetarians, and they feed on algae and other plants in the water. Despite their fearsome appearance, they have not developed a taste for tourists, fortunately. But you still want to watch where you take a knee. Marine iguanas can move 20 miles an hour. This is my son, Jeff, who was my traveling companion when I visited the Galapagos. When I saw him with his knee on that rock, I was petrified. When El Nino weather events occur, warming water temperatures mean that there's less algae, which is the main source of food for the marine iguanas. Scientists who noticed that the animals seemed smaller at such times believe that the reptiles may reabsorb parts of their skeleton in order to decrease their size and thus increase their chances of survival when food supplies run very low. Of course, everybody wants to see the blue-footed boobies. The name comes from the Spanish word bobo for clown because they are sort of clumsy when walking on land. In flight, they are graceful and effective at catching sardines, which is their basic food. The famous blue feet play an important role in sexual attraction. The females <clears throat> prefer males with big, bright blue feet. Their courtship ritual involves a peculiar dance in which the male showcases his each foot alternately, and if a female is interested, she responds by mimicking his dance moves. We humans tend to think that clothes make the man, but clearly blue suede shoes make the booby. These smiley face land iguanas have reason to be happy as the species has been saved from decline and possible extinction several times in their recorded history. Charles Darwin had noted in his journal that these iguanas were so plentiful that the crew of his ship could hardly find a place to set up a tent without stepping on them. But by 1976, feral dogs had wiped out all but the, a few remaining colonies. The Galapagos Conservancy and Darwin Research Station set up captive breeding and reintroduction programs. Currently, the land iguanas um, are no longer listed as endangered. They are merely vulnerable. I love the way their skin gives the appearance that they are wearing a neckerchief and a hood and even a tunic with nice long loose sleeves. The Galapagos penguin is the only penguin species that ever appears in the Northern Hemisphere. These penguins are found at the top of Isabella Island. 
which as you can see is above the equator. We usually think of penguins against a background of snow and ice, but that humble current swirling up from the Antarctic Ocean gives these penguins the cold water that they need to live on the equator. There are other things that one finds only in the Galapagos. Divers are quick to brag when they have been swimming with the marine iguanas. Mary, remember those scary black movie monsters? The iguanas can hold their breath for up to 30 minutes with no scuba equipment needed. And this park ranger is giving a lecture on iguana poop. When I travel, I think about photos that will educate, or in the case of iguana poop, entertain my middle school grandsons. It's always good to know your audience. And here is the world's most unusual post office. When sailors in the 1700s stopped at the Galapagos, probably to capture those tortoises we spoke about before, they all knew about a special barrel on Floriana Island. They would put letters in the barrel addressed to people back home with the hope that crew members of another ship making a similar stop would take the letters and mail them whenever they themselves reached the mainland. Well, this is now a favorite tourist activity. The tour leader reaches into the barrel, pulls out a handful of postcards, and reads off destinations. People are encouraged to mail or even to deliver in person cards left by other tourists before leaving their own for another group of tourists to find. I mailed a card left by someone from Chevy Chase, Maryland. The Galapagos are an evolution laboratory for plants as well as animals. About 35% of the plants there are endemic to the Galapagos. They adapted to several different habitat zones based on altitude and growing conditions. The passion flower is the official flower of the islands and it has medical properties. Three familiar cactuses are the lava cactus and the, <clears throat> excuse me, candelabra cactus and the prickly pear cactus. The candelabras can reach as tall as a tree. But forests in the Scalesia zone only look like trees, but they are actually giant members of the daisy family. And thus the Scalesia forests are sometimes called daisy forests. The Scalesia have been referred to as the Darwin finches of the plant world because of how each kind has adapted to different conditions across the various islands. But all the islands are under assault from invasive species that can too easily destroy endemic species, both plants and animals. Fortunately, several conservation organizations fight the never ending battle to protect the endemic animals and plants. The Galapagos Conservancy focuses exclusively, exclusively on the long-term welfare of the Galapagos Islands. It funds research and wildlife rescue programs. It has public education programs to promote understanding 
of the scientific importance of this extraordinary ecosystem. You will note that the Galapagos Conservancy is headquartered in Fairfax, Virginia. The Charles Darwin Foundation has similar objectives, but also works with international organizations. And both of them rely on donations from viewers like you, as they say on PBS. Well, sorry you've got to go, um, but please come back soon and travel safely. The end. <laughs> Bonnie, can you hear me? I'm not sure if I'm unmuted. Yes, yes I can. That was absolutely amazing. Oh, I'm so glad you liked it. Thank you so much. I am looking in the chat box now to see if we have any questions for you. Okay. Um, first question I see is, how long is a flight to the islands and where do you depart from? Oh, well, Ecuador, uh, LAN is the uh, a, um, airline carrier that uh, has regular service to the Galapagos. And the flight is, I don't know, 600 miles, what would that be from here to um, what, maybe near to Denver, something like that. Um, so it's, um, you know, three hours maybe. Okay, bear with me one second. Another question that I, I wanted an answer to just snipped by me. Uh, what top three islands would you recommend visiting and how many days should one allow for a visit to the island? Well, I, I think um, actually it's not so much that you uh, get in your little boat and paddle to an island, but rather that the tours are licensed to go to, to some of the islands. And of course, some of them you can't go to at all. So what you really do is you look at several tour operators and see if they, um, if they will go to the islands that you are interested in. Uh, but again, it's only the ones that where tourists are really allowed to go. And I don't know, I would, I would think I would wanna be there for four days or so, no? at least. Um, we, had, we had time to go, um, I did not go scuba diving with the marine iguanas, I have to be honest about that, but I did go snorkeling and we did snorkel with sea lions. So that was um, almost as good and didn't look as dangerous to me. <laughs> Very good. Is there a best time of year to visit? Oh, um, well, it, it doesn't have the swing of seasons that our area does. Uh, think, uh, think Hawaii, you know, it, uh, Hawaii is more in the Northern Hemisphere than, than this area is. But um, there is a, a drier season and a warmer season. I mean, you don't you don't want to go when an El Nino is coming. And the El Ninos often happen around Christmas. That's why it's called the Nino, the, the Christ child. But yet it doesn't happen all of the time. So that would be the thing you would want to be uh, taking a look at to, to see whether the El Nino was there or not. Okay. Um, prior to me joining AARP as a volunteer, I spent 25 years in the hospitality industry. So I have to ask, where does one stay? Oh, well, there are as there are several uh, five-star resorts on the island, but you're not going to find high-rise um, Four Seasons that kind of thing. They are listed on the internet anyway as five-star. I uh, I was on a ship, and so therefore I really can't speak to the um, the hotel facilities. But there are hotels that are on. Um, the four inhabited islands of Isabella and then um, Santa Cruz, particularly. Okay. Did you? I, I like the idea of being on a ship because it seemed like if you're going to be visiting islands, that you would more want to be um, kind of in touch with the water, you know? 
<laughs> Just for clarification, did you say that 25,000 people live on the islands? Yes, on, the, on those four islands. On the four islands. Yeah. When is the drier season? I'm going to say I don't know specifically. Um, we were there. I'm trying to think. It, it's pretty. It's pretty dry a good portion of the year. It, so I would suggest that you check the internet to find exactly the um, the um, graph of which ones are drier or not. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, a question is: Does the Galapagos Conservatory arrange trips? Or how would one go about starting the, the research to take such a trip? Oh, okay. Uh, the job of the conservancy is not uh, arrange trips for tourists, no. But of course, with every, anything these days, you start with the internet and you just go to tourism in Galapagos and there are um, <laughs> there were before, before COVID. And of course, at this point, tourism is the main money source for the islands. They were very poor and less than 25,000 people until tourism came. And now um, um, all, of the, all of the really valuable money comes from tourism. And there were lots of different uh, tour companies. So that's really where you, that's really where you start. And I'm, you know, um, doesn't AAFRP has a travel department too? I'm sure they'd be very happy to help you out of that. <laughs> very good. Um, is Galapagos being affected by too many tourists? Well, <laughs> almost any of the really wonderful um, UNESCO heritage sites have that problem. And in fact, um, nowadays, the, the process of getting a site listed with UNESCO, the site has to uh, jump through all sorts of hoops to show that they can manage the facility and the expected rise in tourism without it, you know, it getting, as they say, loved to death. The same thing happened with Machu Picchu. When Machu Picchu got named one of the new seven wonders of the world, uh, it became even more popular than it already was. And they had to institute all sorts of regulations to keep the place from just being overrun. So um, there, there are controls on the, um, on the islands to regulate the, um, the number of tourists and where they can go and you know all, all that sort of thing. Our ship was extremely eco-conscious and they had just forbidden plastic everything. And um, they were eliminating as much paper as possible and so forth. So um, many, many people, many organizations that, that I've been aware of are really getting extremely eco-conscious when it comes to the impact of tourists on the areas that they are trying to showcase. Very good. Uh, Bonnie, one last question, because we're about to run out of time here. Um, but I do think it's a good question, except my screen just flipped and now I can't see it. Um, what do the people that live there do to survive economically? <laughs> tourism, tourism, okay. yeah, tourism. And I, I know it's been a little while since you've been there, but has the islands been affected by COVID and the pandemic? Oh, as far as getting COVID, well, they've really been affected is that tourism has evaporated. And so you had basically, you know, like 80% of the economy based on tourism. And then when nobody can go there anymore, that's a, a, a really big hit. So. Okay, very good. Bonnie, this was absolutely wonderful. And I've got, I see lots of comments in the uh, chat section. Um, thanking you for the presentation and commenting on how wonderful the presentation was. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so glad. So everyone can just show, um, they can show their appreciation by sending a donation to the, the Galapagos Conservancy in Fairfax, Virginia. <laughs> we will be an in-joke for all of the people who are, who are living in Northern Virginia, not the, you know, 
people out in Santa Monica, California, or wherever they were from. Okay, very good. On behalf of AARP Virginia, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Bonnie Becker, for sharing her valuable time and knowledge with us this afternoon. We would love to get your feedback on today's program for ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you will see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We will also include this link in a follow-up email to you later today. We hope to see you all back here in two weeks for our next program on Tuesday Explorers. On Tuesday, April 13th at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time, we're going to learn about the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville. Why did they go to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina to try their first flight? Don't forget, there's a link to RSVP in the chat box. Until then, stay safe, stay curious, keep exploring, and thank you all for joining us today. Bonnie, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me.